Hello, good morning and welcome to the Football Digest weekly podcast. And what a tough week it's proving to be for Man United and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in the wake of last week's utterly humiliating home defeat to bitter rivals Liverpool. How has Solskjaer survived the sack? Uh, what will United do next, perhaps? Why is it all unravelled for Solskjaer and will he survive again if United lose at Spurs this weekend? It's not a great situation at United at the minute, you have to say. Elsewhere, Liverpool... Continue to march on with Mo Salah looking unstoppable while City and Chelsea keep pacing them at the top of the table. It looks like a three-horse race for the title this season. Uh, City, though, have done the unthinkable and crashed out of the EFL Cup last night. Uh, the first defeat in the competition since 2016, which is an astonishing record, really. Uh, we'll look at the midweek. We've got results in that competition and some of the big games coming up this week. And we'll also um, discuss or touch on the sad death of Walter Smith, the Scottish uh, managerial legends. So joining me to discuss all of this this week, I'm glad to say Simon Mullock, Chief Football Writer of the Sunday Mirror, Chris McKenna, Football Correspondent of the Daily Star, and on debut, Gideon Brooks, Football and Cricket Correspondent at the Daily Express. Welcome along, fellas. Um, there's only one place to start, I suppose. Chris, you were at Old Trafford last Sunday. You must have been sort of shaking your head in disbelief what you were witnessing there. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was unbelievable in one sense, but if you've been watching Man United the last few weeks, there was always the risk of something like that happening because they've been so defensively poor and open, which they showed at Leicester. Liverpool have been so good of late in scoring five goals the week before against Watford. So if it was ever, it was going to happen. But those games are often so, those Man United-Liverpool games are often so tight and nil-nils, one-nils, one-ones and all a bit, drab and because uh, they build it up so much as this huge game and then they, they don't deliver but so it was a surprise in that sense to see it so open but after a few minutes when Liverpool literally just walked through Man United's defence with with nobody anywhere along the back line you just knew that this was going to be a bad bad afternoon for United and it turned out I mean I think that's got to be the, the low point certainly since probably the 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 eighties for them, I think, because it was just a horrible, horrible afternoon. Simon, you um, we've just seen Barcelona sat Ronald Koeman this morning. He's only been in charge fourteen months. They've obviously decided it's just going nowhere under him. I know they've obviously got a lot of problems off the pitch, but it's taken a decisive decision because fourteen months is not long, really, is it? Um, do you think United should have done the same with Solskjaer? I, I think the problem that United have uh, have got. Um, is that they've not really they've not really planned for this scenario. You know, they they've not they've not planned for defeats like five 0 against Liverpool. That you know, they, they gave uh Solskjaer a new three year contract in the summer. So clearly, you know, he was gonna be the man for the foreseeable future. And and I just think there's been a, a kind of oversight, if you like, because every, every club should have a plan B. And it just looks like the board at United and Ed Woodward, unfortunately again, just haven't thought that you know it could go wrong and it has gone wrong and I think if there had been an obvious candidate available this time they probably would have um, sacked Solskjaer by now but I, I just think again I don't think they know you know who they would go for if they uh, if they if they sacked him so um, you know we saw it we saw it at Tottenham last season when when they sacked Mourinho without really having a plan in mind for, for a replacement, how how it can go wrong, and and I think that's uh, that's the only thing saving Solskjaer at the moment. So you think he's basically still in a job by default? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know the thing is with with Solskjaer, uh, we've seen it before. He normally, when he needs a, a result in a big game, he's normally able to to conjure one up. And and this time it, it just went completely wrong on on Sunday. And to be honest, you know L Liverpool will actually be disappointed that it was only five. I mean, you know, that United down to 10 men with half an hour to go, they could have really, really made it um, impossible for Solskjaer's reign to, to continue. The, the, you know, it was, it, and it was Liverpool taking the, 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 you know, their foot off the, the accelerator. It didn't have anything to do with United suddenly finding some result from somewhere. Liverpool just toyed with them from the, for the last half hour instead of really going for the, the kill. Gids, you watch a lot of United like me. We go to Old Trafford quite a lot. You get the sense that Ollie's quite well liked by everyone. And, you know, he's obviously a club legend, um, scored the winning goal to get them the Champions League in 99. Uh, popular fella, always decent to deal with. 
But you gotta get this sense that he still lives in awe of Fergie. Fergie's hanging around in the background at most games. There's that famous story about he refused to park in the manager's space because he thought it was disrespectful to Fergie. Do you think that's an unhealthy scenario for Solskjaer? Actually, an unhealthy scenario for anyone who, who comes in and succeeds in. Uh, yeah, I think it, I think it's become that. But in in, in lots of ways, uh, Solskjaer was the the reconnect with that era that they wanted in the first place. So his unique selling point was his connection with that era after the un unhappiness and the and the sort of bitterness of of Mourinho and the. The fact that Louis van Gaal was not massively popular amongst the players or the fans with the with football he played, Solskjaer was this reconnect with that that golden era. So that that carried him on a, on a wave for a certain amount of time. But the fact that it, it's the fact that Ferguson still remains in the background is not particularly healthy. There were a couple of occasions this week or over the past few weeks where Ferguson's interventions in in the in the piece have been at best clumsy and and at, at worst downright unhelpful there was the the fighter that he talked to and he was videoed questioning his his uh, his non selection of ronaldo over uh, after the everton game um I could, chris will tell me who the fighter was and he pronounce it perfectly now won't you chris uh What's well, so I didn't. I must have missed that. Who, who was, it was it? Some, some MMA fighter. But oh, it, it, MMA's it was, not my strong point, unfortunately. No, Ferguson was was videoed and sort of saying you've got to play your best players. There was the, the you know the shake of the head, which is understandable when when Liverpool are banging the goals in and Ferguson's picked out in the crowd and he's shaking his head, but it's not helpful. And then the, yesterday there were it was a, a, a commercial opportunity which was at Carrington, which um, Martin Edwards and um, Ferguson. Were, were present at which again the timing was was terrible you, you you just do it away from Carrington if um you know it's it's all his, his very connection with Ferguson was his unique selling point in the first place but his connection with Ferguson and his deference to Ferguson is, is sort of his undoing now I think Chris we, when um when a manager's job comes up a top job like the Chelsea job came up last season when Frank Lampard got the bullet when a job like that becomes available, you get you obviously get the email from the bookies about who's who the odds are to take over, you know, who's the favourite. You never see Soska on any list. It's it never gets linked with another job. Do, do you think that's quite sort of telling of how his standing is viewed? Yeah, well, well, if he wasn't an ex Man United player, he would never have been within a million years of that job. It is his C V is uh, winning the Norwegian league a couple of times with Mold, Mold here, and then getting Cardiff relegated. Um, like that's not a CV that's going to get you a, 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 even a mid mid table Premier League job. There was no clubs coming back in for him. Um, it was a surprise when United brought him in as that kind of interim manager um, when they when they sacked Mourinho, and it was like, okay, he's brought in to kind of fix the club and bring that good feeling back and all of this that maybe would have been fine for the rest of that season but because he got a few good results and the, the PSG games and that I think they kind of not panicked but they they just thought oh, well, oh maybe this is it maybe this is what we needed blah, blah, blah. without actually taking a cold hard look at it and go he hasn't got to CV as a manager he hasn't got the credentials as a manager to be in such a job um, he's not got the proven track record because you always hear it and then, oh, well, Ferguson struggled in his early years. You, you, need, you need time. But Alex Ferguson had had gone and broken the Rangers Celtic uh, domination of Scottish football. He'd gone and beaten Real Madrid in a European final. He had a massive CV. You knew there was a really good manager there. It just needed time for him to get in and build something. Solskjaer hasn't shown that in the past. So, I think we're, we're massive. They must look back now. I think with massive regret in, the, in that decision because Pochettino, I think, would have been available that summer or certainly gettable that summer, and I think he would have been the manager that they needed. And now he's tied up in, in a major job, so Solskjaer won't be linked with other jobs. And I, I'd be very even surprised when he does get sacked from Manchester United because I, I think it's inevitable now. I think it'll either be. In the next three games, or at the very latest, I think it'll be in the summer. Um, is it is another top European club going to come in from 
no chance. I think he's going to be either going back down towards the bottom half of the Premier League or or maybe going back home even. So when you look at United on paper, they've got some wonderful players, haven't they? They've got probably one of the strongest squads in the Premier League with Ronaldo and Sancho and Rashford and Maguire, you know, all really, really top-class players. Um, but they don't play like a team to me. They look like a team that are poorly coached. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I also think that, it's, that it, even though they've got some great individuals, the team is just so um, unbalanced. You know, they, they everybody knew in the summer that they were short of at least one holding midfielder, that that was a position that was a real weakness for them last season and has been for you know for quite some time, probably since since Michael Carrick um, retired, you know, and and it's 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 they've just not filled that position, you know. We've seen, sorry, yeah, he could come back. Well, Skulls came back, didn't he, and 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 sorted them out for a, for for a couple of years after he retired. So you you know, who knows? But like like I say, there's just a huge imbalance in the squad. I think you know, they've got um you know they've got Jaden Sancho sat on the bench now. Um, you know, Paul Pogba, Paul Pogba sat on the bench. Um, you know, uh, Edinson Cavani signed a, a new contract in the summer after being persuaded that he, that he was going to be, you know, the, the leader of the attack. He's been sat on the bench because suddenly, again, they panicked and signed Cristiano Ronaldo. And, you know, part of, you know, Ronaldo has, has, has scored goals since he's come back to the club. But I think he's a major part of the problem. Yeah. Because you know people are talking about United United's lack of the press. Well, they're never going to press with a thirty-six-year-old centre forward who who basically his responsibility or he thinks his re- his only responsibility is to get himself in the box and get on get on the end of, of crosses and passes. Um, so again, you know, it's 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 another one of those where let's be honest, United signed Ronaldo because because they knew that, that City were, were about to sign him. That was, that was the only reason. And how many times has that happened in the past? You know, they signed Fred. They, you know, they, they, they panicked and, and handed um, uh, 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 Sanchez 500 grand a week, um, you know, just out of the blue, because they didn't want City to sign him. And, and they've got, they, you know, it's, that's not how a big club operates. And, uh, and uh, you know, you go back to the, 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 the sacking since, um, since Ferguson retired. You know, it was it was a knee jerk reaction to Moyes. Moyes didn't get time to put his, his fingerprint on the team. Um, the the, the uh, removal of Van Gaal was really messy. And then when um, Mourinho was sacked, they had no option but to 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 beg um, Solskjaer to leave Mulder to to, to come in and kind of steer the ship for that season. And, and we all know what's happened since. So uh, I don't know. I think it starts at the very top. Uh, United and they're in a bit of a mess at the moment. Gids, you know when you look at teams like um, Liverpool, Chelsea and Man City, they're all coached by elite managers aren't they? You can't compare Solskjaer, and you can't put him in that bracket can you? I think that's a fair assumption to make and also until United do get one of those elite coaches, then they're not going to realistically win big trophies again are they? No, no I don't think so uh, just echoing Simon's point there you know Ronaldo's effect is, is, is like throwing a big rock in a in a pond and not expecting there to be ripples. And there's been ripples all the way through the side. There's a, you know, like you say, Cavani sitting on the sidelines. Greenwood, you know, there are rumours that that Ronaldo's unhappy with with Greenwood not passing to him or not being on the same wavelength. Well, this is you know, it's potentially Ronaldo's arrival is is sort of uh, is hampering one of the most promising young strikers in. In Brilliant. Fernandez seems a shadow of his former self because he's in this in the in the shadow of, of Ronaldo. And and but going to the coaching side of things, I think the coaching, I think the coaches, because of their inexperience, have, have, have shrunk since last season. And it's it's kind of blindsided United. The, this sort of shows your medals culture on the on the training ground. You throw in someone like all these stars, Ronaldo, Cavani. Pogba and and the coaches seem seem to be shrinking back. Um, McKenna's, you know, they're saying that McKenna and and Carrick haven't got the experience, and Solskjaer hasn't got the experience. He doesn't do hands-on coaching. The the coaching crew management team are shrinking in in the face of of bigger stars on on the on the training ground, and I think that's it's it's, it's amazing how quickly it's all unravelled. But it has unravelled from a 
point in the summer where they gave him a new three-year contract and everything was rosy and suddenly, you know, throw Ronaldo in the mix. I, I agree with Sai. It's, it, it seems to have unbalanced the whole lot. What, what surprised me about Sunday was just watching that. It was Solskjaer on his own on the touchline for, for the game. Like, where, why, why was a McKenna character down there giving instruction, reorganising it? It was clear at 2-0 it was going horribly wrong. They needed to do changes. Just from watching Liverpool and Everton, which I obviously watch more of, and you're at the ground, you can see what the coach is at. With Liverpool, Pep Linders, John Attenberg, the goalkeeper coach, they're constantly up and down off the bench, giving instructions, helping Klopp, speaking to Klopp. It just didn't seem to be like that from United on Sunday when they needed to make changes as the game was getting away from them. And you got to wonder why those coaches are not coming down to, to a system. Do they feel they don't have to? Do they feel that they, they can't? I, I, I don't know what the answer there, but it, it was very strange to me. Chris, you um, if you were the Glazers, what would you do? How would you solve this problem? Because they just they seem to be like on some sort of roundabout, just going around in circles. I think Simon mentioned earlier, the problem is that the, the right manager they probably feel isn't out there at the minute. But the problem is, what what could happen is, and look, it's very unlikely, it, not unlikely, they could get a good result at Tottenham, I think. That's possible. Tottenham, even though they, they've got a good number of points, they haven't been playing brilliantly yet this season. You know, you could go win there and then people start thinking, oh, maybe. And then imagine they go and get a result at City, you know, I'm not. Th- I don't think they will. I think it could be another bad afternoon for them. But if they did, and then everybody suddenly starts thinking, "Oh well, look, it's all right. It was just a blip. Blah blah blah. He's back." But I think that would be the worst thing to happen for United because I think it would just paper over the cracks, and they they won't start looking for that next plan. I think. Well, I think they. I think they should have maybe sacked him this week, and they should have brought had somebody as caretaker manager while they get some while they look at the plan and leave somebody in there for the next three or four games until after the international break because i just think the longer they leave him in there he's a club legend he's he's forever remembered for scoring in the champions league final but if it starts to go really nasty his kind of legacy and that will be damaged by it and i don't think that's fair on on the guy i mean you guys deal with him a lot more than me he seems like a decent bloke to, to, to deal with for professionally. Um, everybody around the club seems to talk highly of him as a person. So I think that would be unfair to leave him in there too long and, and certainly till the end of the season because I think there could be another few more bad games for him. So if they were to lose, for example, I don't know, 2 or 3 nil at Tottenham on Saturday, do you think he'll get sacked? Um, I don't know. Because again, it goes back to the who who do, who do they bring in? You know who 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 have they got in the pipeline to to take over that team? And um, I, I'm not, I just don't see a candidate out there. You know, pe- people are talking about Conte. Well, he's available. Surely, if if he was the man that 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 they want, they would have you know they would have sacked Oscar this week and and, and brought Conte in. Um, you know, it, it it's a mess. And and going back to what Chris was saying. I, unless you're a Liverpool fan, you couldn't help but feel sorry for Solskjaer as he made that walk down the, the touchline. You know, um, after the game on on Sunday, he just looked completely shell shocked. And uh, I actually thought, looking at his face, there, I thought he might have actually quit. You know, quit the job there and then um, because he's a, he's a United man. He's United through and through. He loves the club, and I, I actually think, and this is one of the problems. I think that defeat hurt Solskjaer. A million times more than it hurt any of the players. Um, you know, they, they they just didn't seem to be in any fight. You know, l- listen, they were always going to get beat as soon as Liverpool scored the first goal. It was always going to be a Liverpool win, but there just didn't seem to be any fight there. We talk about you know co- coaching, but where where was the pride? Where was the passion? They're playing for Man United against Liverpool. This is you know the biggest game in in English football, and and, and Liverpool just made it look like a, a training ground exercise. Like I say, they could have scored. They Liverpool could have scored as many goals as they wanted. There was absolutely no resistance there from United whatsoever, and and I think that it it, it was that part of the performance as much as the the disorganisation of United and how disjointed they were that that should be a big worry for for everyone at Old Trafford. You mentioned Ronaldo. Sorry, go on, Griggs. I was just going to say that that, that I think you, you, without a without a def, definite plan in place as in the next man, United are in danger of repeating the same mistakes because 
if they get rid of Solskjaer, for, say on Saturday or say after City or say at Christmas, and they put the obvious caretaker before they've got somebody in place is Carrick. And, and if Carrick goes and wins four or five games, in, particularly in Europe or something, they're in danger of repeating the exact same mistake they made last time because there'll be a clamour for a United man, somebody who knows the club, to, to, to be put in place. They've got, they've, got to, they've got to make a clean break this time and it's got to be a fresh direction and, 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 the, and, a, and a well thought out direction. Let's be honest, by the way, they got off the hook against Atalanta. You know, they, 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 they could have easily lost that game and, and they could now, if, if that had happened, I mean, it was a great, you know, credit to United that night. They, they fought like um, Tigers in the second half and turn, turned the game around and they now sit top of the group instead of, of bottom of the group. But could you imagine that if they'd have lost or drawn that game? The pressure then would have been, you know, incredible. And it's, it's a big game against Tottenham, but it's probably an even bigger game in, in Italy and then, and then the Manchester derby. Um, so yeah, you know, three three games really for 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 not just Solskjaer to prove himself, but for the, those players to prove themselves because they let the club down on 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 Sunday, and you know, there's no getting getting away from that. Aren't players when you see players out there who don't seem to care, like Pogba? I know he got, always gets picked out, and other players just sort of floating <laughs> around, not seeming to have the right attitude. They're a reflection of the manager, aren't they? We'll talk about throwing Pogba a, a grenade. You know, they're 4-0 down at half-time against Liverpool and, and he, he's brought on a substitute. Paul Pogba's not going to, you know, rescue Man United from, from that position. Um, I, you know, I, th- I thought he should have been the players who got them in that mess, who should have been told to, to dig the, the team out of it. And um, I, felt, I felt sorry for, for Pogba on Sunday. Um, clearly, you know, it was a bad tackle. It was a red card. But he was, he was, you know, at least he was throwing himself into, into a tackle. I mean, Liverpool looked like they were, they were playing dustbins for the, for the first half. You know, it, 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 it was that easy for them. Um, you That's know, a bit but, harsh on dustbins, pal. Yeah, but, yeah, you know. But I mean, you know, I, I don't think Liverpool could believe just how easy it was to open United up. And um, and like I say, I, I felt a bit, I felt a bit sorry for Pogba being told at half-time that, you know, go, go out there and, and rescue us. He, he, he's supposed to be one of United's stellar players. And, and for the last two games, he's, he's started on the bench, you know. And, and, and this is a club that, that he's supposed to be trying to convince him to sign a new contract. Well, he's not going to sign a new contract if he's been left out of the team yeah. for Champions League games and, and games against Liverpool. Yeah. Gids, G- Conte's been mentioned, obviously, because he's available. He's been mentioned as a possible possible replacement that would go against the whole ethos of the club wouldn't it in the under Solskjaer in terms of how they've approached transfers and building the team because Conti's is an in and out man really and he, he manages at clubs for 18 months two years and then he's gone and he gets another job it just doesn't seem like a, a long-term solution it would be it'd be a return to to Mourinho really it'd be a step backwards wouldn't it um possibly with more success who knows but the the problem with Conte I think that the style he plays would necessitate a complete revamp of, of the squad because the, the the players that United have got are, are not really Conte players, I don't think. So um, he might, you know, that might be doing him a disservice and he might be able to turn players who you, you wouldn't necessarily feel would be his first choices into his first choices, but uh, maybe with the addition of a couple. But I just I just think that Conte is sort of quite an abrasive character. He'd shake up what United are now and, and would be successful. But like you say, it, it's not a long-term solution, is it? And it's not a, it's, it's a, you're going to the Chelsea model, aren't you? Of, of you know, sort of compartmentalising two seasons at a time. Um, and that's not the United way. So I don't see Conte, I, 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 you know, as I said earlier on, if they wanted Conte, they would, have, they would have had him by Tuesday, probably, if he's available. Yeah. Chris, I get from talking to people at United, I get the sense, and Sai alluded to this earlier, that they're just trying to buy themselves some time. You know, they've got obviously two tough, three tough games coming then as an international break. It's one option, perhaps, to look if if they get if they get to the international break and they've lost all those games, or they've had a, a five six goal tonking from City, um, and they have to sack Solskjaer. One option could be to put a caretaker in charge for the rest of the season, limp to the end of the season, then spend the summer getting their elite choice, which would be probably Pochettino or somebody like Brendan Rodgers. But 
you know, would 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 that be a realistic target? Put somebody like Pochettino, because he's obviously at PSG, he's got Lionel Messi in his ranks. It cost a fortune in compensation to to get out of Paris, wouldn't it? I suppose though he might be he might be sacked though by the end of the season because if they don't win the Champions League, I can't see him surviving. Um, I think that's that's the kind of the cutthroat mentality of it. Um, so he might be he might be free in the summer. Um, and I don't don't think that'd be a reflection on on him as a manager if they don't win the Champions League because there's some incredible teams in there, City and Liverpool included. So, um. I, I think that if they're looking to build something and they, they want somebody to come in, play attractive football, Pochettino has shown he can do that with Spurs. I know it kind of went a bit sour at Spurs towards the end, but look at where they are now and he got them to a Champions League final. Um, still think he made a mistake in that Champions League final on Staten Kane when he wasn't fit, but that's another debate. But I think he, he can build something at United if he's given three, four years. Whereas, as you've mentioned, Conte will come in and do two years, might win a trophy, might even put put him into title challenges if he can, but it won't be long term. And then you're going to have the same situation in two years. Rodgers is an interesting one because he's gone and done a, a great job at Leicester. He obviously did a, a great job at Celtic. And you look what's happened there since he's left. I know Scottish football and he didn't have Rangers on, on breathing down his neck um, like they do now, but... He's done a great job at Leicester. The only, I suppose, reservations you'd have with Rodgers is that in, a, in the three seasons in English football when he's been really going for something was with Liverpool when they won the t- when they were in the title race and he kind of made two big mistakes against Chelsea, against Crystal Palace in the tactics and how they went for it. And Leicester in the last two years have been in the Champions League places and have kind of tailed off towards the end. So you do wonder maybe is that the kind of thing or has he learned from those mistakes and now he's kind of a far more well-rounded manager and would the United fans stomach an ex-Liverpool manager coming in? Because you could have the situation where Everton and United are managed by ex-Liverpool managers, which I'm sure would uh, delight certain people on the red half of Merseyside. So two interesting candidates. I mean, I, I think Pochettino would be more suited to it, but... Will he be available? How much will he cost? Well, I think you know it'd have to just stomach it. They've got to pay what they've got to pay because they need the elite manager. If you're going to pay Cristiano Ronaldo a stupid sum of money every week, if you're going to pay eighty million for Harry Maguire, then go out and pay whatever it takes to get in the elite manager because you need it. Because as it's shown, without that, it's the holding midfielder and the elite manager are the two missing pieces in the big jigsaw for them. So, just one last thing before we move on. Um, it's probably unfair to single out two players because I mean, there's no one at United really pulling up any trees at the minute. But when you watch Harry Maguire and Luke Shaw play recently, they absolutely look bereft of confidence all over the place at the back. They were at, both at fault for one of the goals last Sunday. They collided with each on the edge of the box. And you see him play for England and they look totally different players altogether. How do you explain something like that? I just wonder whether both of them are fully fit. You know, Shaw, Shaw uh, um, was injured last month. Uh, Maguire's been injured and had, had some, t- t- you know, time on the sidelines. Have they been rushed back? You know, because they've lost Varane. You know, it, 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 and again, it goes back to trust. You know, in, in terms of United, I've got a, a strong squad, but does does uh, Solskjaer trust all those players in the squad? Because you know, Pog was on. I was mentioning it. Pog was on the bench now. Donny van der Beek has done nothing but sit on a bench for 18 months. Um, you know, Sancho was on the bench. Um, Eric Bailly, you know, another player who's, <clears throat> excuse me, who signed a, a, a new contract and doesn't get a game. And we're told that, you know, part of the reason that Maguire was rushed back against Leicester was because um, Solskjaer didn't really fancy a lindelof Bailly partnership. Well, that's not how big clubs operate. Big clubs, you know, should should have players that can, can come that can come in to cover and who are trusted by the manager. And you know, for, for all the numbers and the quality that United have got in the squad, Solskjaer seems to kind of stick with pretty much the the, the same spine of the team. You know, what, Jesse Lingard. If you're if you're a team that's got designs on pressing the opposition, for me, Jesse Lingard should be in there because of, just because of the energy that he brings. Yeah. Um, you know, he, 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 he's kind of, you know, he can get around the pitch like probably no other player in that squad. 
Um, so, you, you know, going back to your original question about Shaw and Maguire, I just wonder whether both of them are, are, have been rushed back after injury and, and are paying a little bit of a price for that. Gids, Liverpool, obviously, you know, I've made it easy for them on Sunday, but they were ruthless when taking the chances, weren't they? Like Simon said earlier, they could have probably scored eight or nine goals, really. Um, they look back to the best, don't they? look like the team of old of, of two seasons ago when they romped to the title. Yeah, there's a, you know, the, the more you look at it, the more there's a sense that they just kind of took last season on the chin early. Um, I think it was around about this time they lost Van Dijk in, um, in the uh, derby, Merseyside derby. And I think after that, they just sort of, I mean, they clearly went to pieces. Um, they didn't have a crowd. And they just sort of, I think, I think Klopp just kind of accepted that it was going to be a bit of a battle that season. And, and, and as it happened, string at the end, string of wins at the end, just, just crept them into the, into the Champions League places. And, and that was one they've just, they've just parked that season. They, they do look back to where they were two years ago. Um, with the, with, I would say with the exception of, of Marnik, probably Chris might, um, correct me on this, but I've obviously seen more Liverpool. But I, I just think that the, the front three aren't quite um, as set in stone now. Obviously, Jota seems to have superseded Mane in, in the pecking order a little bit, uh, or certainly on big occasions. Um, but yeah, they, they they look back to where they were now, um, and they're going to be a clearly a real force in in all competitions this season. The, in Europe, they've they've looked particularly sort of. Um, resilient as well. So, Chris, Mo Salah's unstoppable at the minute. He's scored, I think I've got this right, 15 goals in his last 12 games, or 12 games yeah. this season, which is an astonishing record. Um, what, what's, what, how do you see the situation with his contract in terms of um, him signing a new one? Because obviously, if he's trying to earn himself a new one, he's going about it the right way, but the Liverpool seem to be dragging their feet a little bit. What do you read into that? I think the main issue is is over the wages. I mean, him Salah and his and his agents are pushing for a figure of around four hundred grand a week, um, which is being quite widely reported now, um, which is an astro astronomical number. But when you look at where he is, you've got Jurgen Klopp saying he's currently the best player in the world, and if he's the best player in the world, what are the best players earning? What's Ronaldo on? What's Messi on? What's De Bruyne on? These type of elite players surely he deserves to get that money and he can certainly get that elsewhere if he wants to to let his contract run down i suppose the risk there is there's still still 18 months and will he be still scoring at this rate in 18 months who knows but um i think liverpool are in a situation where as, as if he keeps scoring goals they're just going to have to 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 pay it basically i know it will kind of shatter their kind of wage structure but there's only there's only one other player at, at Liverpool who I think could 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 come knocking on the the boardroom door and saying, well, what if he's getting four hundred grand? I should be okay. getting, it. and that's Van Dijk, and he's recently signed to a new deal. So, I think Liverpool are in a position where if they don't pay it and the, the he goes, it's going to cost them more money because they're going to have to buy a replacement because as much as Yota has come in and, and done well and he offers them, as Gideon said, something else. And he can rotate a bit more, which is great because he can rest the money. Firmino, Salah doesn't really get rested. But if he needed to, he can rest him because he knows he's got a decent player there in Yota who can play in a similar way. But he ain't going to replace Mo Salah on a regular basis, far from it. So they're going to have to go out and buy somebody who's going to cost a massive transfer fee, probably. Um, and then he's going to want to still want 200 grand plus a week wages anyway. So... I think Liverpool are in a situation where now that Salah's form, Salah's brilliance means they're just going to have to pay it. Otherwise, it's going to send out a, a more worrying message. I think it would be more worrying to his teammates as well if he if he was allowed just to run down his contract because the club didn't want to pay what they want, what he wants, basically. So we've seen down the years, Liverpool have actually lost a lot of players with who had big a big stature at Anfield, haven't they? Coutinho's of this world. Um they can't afford to lose Salah, can they? What message? I mean, that would send a totally wrong message to Klopp, wouldn't it, in terms of the teams, the club's ambition 
Well, it's two things really. Chris spoke about, you know, Liverpool would, you know, have to get a replacement in. It, Mo Salah's is irreplaceable at the moment. He, 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 you know, in, in striking terms, he is that he is the best player in the world. You know, how do you replace somebody like that? Um, you, you know, and the way he's he's playing for a new contract, he's not sulked about the fact that he's not been rewarded with it. He's just got his head down and thought, well, you know, I'm I'm going to show you here, and I'm going to show you that I am worth what I want. I just wonder whether. Liverpool, Liverpool's manager and their owners are singing from a different song sheet because Klopp talks him up every week about you know how good he is and how important he is to the team. And I would imagine every time there's a press conference and and Klopp is glowing about Salah, there's a few shakes of the head in in Boston, thinking, well, you know. And I just wonder whether Klopp, if it was down to Klopp, he would give Salah what he wants and 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 be done with it. You know, he's 29. He's, he just looks at the top of his game at the moment. And, and I just think Liverpool need to act like the club they are and make sure that their best player and one of the best players in the world is is happy there. Um, you know, it is irreplaceable at the minute, Mo Salah. Gids, um, Sai said that, mentioned there, that Salah's age is 29. He's probably thinking my next move or my next contract is my last really big one of my career. And he's playing so well. He's, he seems to hold all the aces in, in that respect in terms of he's fully justified. If he is asking for £400,000 a week, I mean, that's what elite players deserve, isn't it? I think the, I think the, uh, the goalposts have shifted a little bit on, on where, a, <coughs> excuse me, where a, an elite player's career might finish. The money is so huge now that we're talking about and, and the, the benefits of staying in at the elite level for another year or two are so big that that people are probably even more so than they were five five years ago looking after themselves um you know doing the right things keeping the motivation keeping the hunger and those these top players can can extend their career by another two years you're talking huge huge amounts of money and benefits so i think you know looking at 30, 29, you've still got another five years at the top if you look after yourself. And so there's no reason to think that Salah's output would drop at all over the course of a, I don't know what he'd be wanting. Chris might be able to tell me that is it a four year contract or a five year contract? Um, usually it's about a five year contract, isn't it? But yeah, um, five. Yeah. So if it's a five year contract, he, I, I think it, these players are looking after themselves so well now that that um, I don't think the age is a concern. Chris, it's uh, been the Carabao Cup this week. Um, sorry, Sai, but there's only one place to start, mate. City are out of the Carabao Cup. It's like the shock of the season so far. Were you, um, were you surprised to see them go out? Pep made nine changes, didn't he, last night? Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 it looked like a team of nine changes as well. They, yeah. they were, you know, they were really kind of, um, they just weren't at it last night at all. Um, you know they went out on penalties. I think West Ham probably just about shaded shaded the game in terms in terms of chances and and probably deserved to go through. And um, you know D- David Moyes is, is doing a great job there. And but listen, if you if you lose one game every five years in a knockout competition, then you're not doing you're not doing too badly. Uh, you know four, four on the bounce for for Guardiola, and it's a competition that he's kind of really attacked. Since he since he uh, came to Manchester, so um, I, I don't think there there is too much disappointment that they had said about about losing it, you know, losing that game, and it was good, you know, it was good to see, um, it, it, you know, it was good to see some of City's young young players in there again, you know, Cole Palmer, who I think looks a, a real player, he, he was given a start, and um, yeah, I, I don't think there'll be uh, there'll be t- there'll be too much disappointment that they had said that they're out of the uh, Carabao this year. He'll be annoyed though, won't he? Fair to say, he'll be annoyed at going out, Pep. Oh, massive, yeah. well, that's the thing. He, he attacks. You know, that's the great thing about him. He, he he's attacked every competition that he's that he's involved in. You know, he, he'll have, he, Pep was disappointed to to lose the uh, Community Shield. That's that's his mindset. He want he wants to win everything. Um. So yeah, of course the manager will be disappointed. But but like I say, you know, it's it's one defeat in five years in a knockout competition is is an incredible record. And um. You know, it, it, it was just one of those nights last night. City weren't the usual selves because of the amount of changes that they made. And like I say, I thought West Ham 
probably just about deserve to win. Good. City, um, I read a stat this morning where they had 25 attempts on goal last night. Obviously, couldn't get that breakthrough um, against what has to be said, a really well-drilled West Ham side now under David Moyes. But does that stat highlight the fact that City actually still need a number nine? I do you think that's unfair? Because they've been scoring loads of goals this season from all sort of sources. Um, do, do you think they still... I mean, there's a reason why Pep wanted to sign Kane, isn't there? You know, he didn't get him, but he wanted to sign him. Must be a reason for that. And that reason still exists, surely. I, I mean, they won the title last year without one. They keep scoring goals, as you rightly point out, without one. Um, Pep, yeah, it's, it's always said, isn't it, that he'd, he'd love a, a team full of midfielders and he seems to just keep buying midfielder after midfielder after midfielder. But um, do they need one? Uh, there, there'll be occasions when they lose, as he always points out, where people say, yes, when they win 5-0, no. Um, there's certainly, I think what's un, undisputable is, or indisputable is, is the, the fact that they'd be improved by having someone like Haaland or Kane in the side, definitely. But you have those, you're going to have those nights where sometimes it just doesn't go in for you, aren't you? Chris, I'll come back to him next side. So I just want to ask you a question. Do you think... Uh, City will go back in for Kane next summer? No, I, I don't think so, no. Um, I, I, I think it was it was, it was was now or never in terms of, of Harry Kane. He'll be a, he'll be a year older. Um, <clears throat> they needed him now, you know, uh, uh, in, in another year. Ferran Torres will be, you know, w- w- his development will have continued once he's come back from injury. But going back to City, I think the, the, the worrying thing for them is we've just spoken about Mo Salah and how he has kind of hit, hit, hit the ground running this season. Kevin De Bruyne for City just looks well off the pace at the moment. And De Bruyne came back from um, from the Euros with an ankle problem and has admitted that he shouldn't really have played in the, uh, in the game against Italy. He played with painkilling injections. And City are having to nurse him a little bit at the moment because it, it, I understand that if that problem gets worse, then he, he, he might need an operation. And De Bruyne really does, like say, he looks he looks well off the pace at the moment. He came off the bench um, at Brighton on Saturday, got a rest at Brighton on Saturday, came on for the last fifteen minutes, and, and looked, you know, he's knocking the ball around and looked and looked back to his somewhere near his normal self. But last night, he, he, again, he, he just looked a little bit short, and I just wonder he, whether he's another player. We mentioned, um, you know, Maguire and Shaw earlier. I just wonder whether he's another player who's playing at the moment when he's not fully fit and he's paying the price for that. What's your view on the Sterling situation? Because it's clearly something's obviously gone on between him and Pep between the summer and the start of the season. So he's done, he can't get a look in, can he really, in the league? In the well, I, think, I think it goes goes back further than that. He hardly played a game at the end of last season. It was a big surprise when he then got the nod for the, the Champions League, yeah. league final. Um, and then obviously City were, were chasing Kane during the summer. They brought Grealish in, who plays on, on in that wide left position. Um, and I just think, you know, I think that's sort of disturbed Raheem a little bit. And he, he's, he's examining his options, which he's, he's got every right to do. And at the moment, um, neither party can get an agreement on that. And again, that's an, that's another one that's you know that's ticking down. They need really to get that 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 over the line. Uh, before the summer, really, because when you get into the, the final, as we've seen with Pogba, when you get into the final 12 months, then it becomes really difficult. And I just think the sticking point is Sterling needs reassurances about what, what you know what Guardiola's plans are, and Guardiola isn't the kind of manager to give players any you know any player any guarantees. But there'd be a limited pool of clubs available where it, where he could go, wouldn't there, in terms of his wages and stuff like that. Well, you just thought, listen, if if he's only got one year left on his contract and, and you know, it's clear that he's up for sale, then, you know, his value, it, it w- won't be as much as it as it would have been two, two, three years ago when City had him secured to a long-term contract. So there is a kind of limited number of clubs um, out there who've got the money to kind of pay the fee and pay the wages. And, you know, Raheem himself has said that he'd, he'd like to go and play abroad. Now, Clearly, when you when players talk like that, you, you, the, the clubs, without mentioning them, you know Barcelona and Real Madrid, you know, would Raheem Sterling be a, a priority for either of those clubs? It's been mentioned that Barcelona might go in for him in January and try and get him on loan. 
which is an absolute non-starter as far as City would be concerned. But um, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm sure if 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 and when Raheem Sterling becomes available, I don't think there'll be a shortage of clubs. It's, it's whether those clubs match, match his ambitions. Chris, that knocking City out of the Carabao Cup last night, it's another feather in the cap for David Moyes. When you look at the job he's doing there, the fourth in the Premier League, they've infiltrated the top six now, basically. Um, they've won all three games in Europe so far this season. It's, it's, I mean, they had such a good season last season, it's often difficult to follow that up in it, but they've hit the ground running again. He's doing an amazing job there, David Moyes. Yeah, if he hadn't have already managed Manchester United, he'd probably be linked with the job now, wouldn't he? Like, it, it, I mean, that may have been what has improved him as a manager so much, those experiences, because United, it, it went horribly wrong. Then he went to Spain, it didn't go well. Sunderland was a disaster too. I mean, that was a bit of a basket case of a club. So you've got to give him maybe a bit of leniency on that, but... The job he's done in, in, in two stints at West Ham has been remarkable. And I think the fourth at the minute, there are, is it three points behind City in the league? Like, I mean, that's incredible when you consider, like, their, their, their main striker is Antonio. He's had injury problems, but when he's at his best, he's brilliant. That they've, He's built this squad without spending stupid money and um, made clever signings like Kurt Zuma, I think was... A really been a really really good signing for them. They got a, a really good solid defence. Um, obviously Declan Royce in midfield is is huge for them, and yeah, maybe reliant on him staying fit. But yeah, it's it's remarkable really what what he's done there to have West Ham competitive now up there, and the way the season's going with United being so poor, you've got to say that they can keep it up. They they could be pushing for a Champions League place, which would be some achievement for them. Yeah. Kids, there's 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 a lot of big guns made it through to the quarter final draw of the Carabao Cup. Arsenal, Chelsea, Tottenham, Liverpool, Leicester are through. Do you see that competition being totally wide open now? Because obviously City have gone out and they've just had the copyright on it for the last four years. Any one of those clubs would be would be really keen to win it, wouldn't they? Yeah, it's um it's quite it's quite London loaded this year as well, isn't it? I, it if if there were any justice in the world after putting United and City out, David Moyes would would use that as a hopefully as a as a, I mean West Ham would look at that as a testing ground for whether they could go on to a, a maybe a Europa League um spot and then maybe even forward from that who knows but um Leicester would be in the mix Spurs might be in the mix although I was at Burnley last night they were deeply unimpressive but um gathering momentum um and yeah, I mean, uh, it's, I don't know. I don't, it's, it's one of those where you, it'd be sort of four to one the field, wouldn't it? Uh, I can't really, you couldn't put a, you couldn't put a finger on who, who sort of um, would be favourite in that field. Yeah. So there's some big weekend games this, uh, this weekend um, at both ends of the table. I've just highlighted Norwich v Leeds um, <coughs> towards the bottom end, sadly. Um, Norwich obviously got an absolute pasting last week at, at Chelsea seven nil. Um, but I was looking at Leeds; they've really gone off the boil under Bielsa. Um, they've got one win in their last nine, and they've only won twice all season. Are you surprised at that? I mean, they were so so sort of entertaining and refreshing last season. Do you think think the novelty of them has worn off? Well, they didn't do an awful lot of business in the transfer market, so it's going to be. You know, pretty much the same players that that did such a great job last year were were, were being trusted to to do the same again, and you know there, there is always that kind of element that once once a team spent a, a year in the, the Premier League, opponents do kind of come to terms with them and, and and find ways, you know, find ways to attack them a little bit. I think one of the there's been a few sort of mitigating circumstances for Leeds, one of which was Calvin Phillips has been. Injured for quite a while. Um, he, again, he looked like a player who was, he was, you know, just slowly feeling his way back. When I watched the uh, them go out of the Carabao Cup at Arsenal uh, the other night, and I just think once they get him back, because he controls a lot of the game for Leeds. I think once he's kind of uh, firing on all cylinders again, I, I think I think Le- Leeds will be okay. Um, not Norwich on the other, the other hand. I mean, I, I, they look relegated already, don't they? Yeah. I mean, you know, you just can't see how they're going to. You, you just don't know where the next point is going to come from. Um, you know, I think they made eleven signings in the summer, um, and I, I don't know as that as that kind of 
um, again, sort of, you know, let, left the squad a little bit kind of unbalanced, you know, while, while they get to know each other and, and, and get to know the, a new club, that get to know the Premier League. It's a lot of new faces to bring in and they just look like, it's like I say, they just look, look like a team that, that's relegated already. When you look at Norwich, do you think that obviously they've become the classic <coughs> yo-yo club? They come up, they go down, they come up again. I know that obviously generates a lot of money in terms of parachute payments and stuff, but you'd think if you're a Norwich fan, when are they going to learn what to do? What what the difference we need to make to to make sure that when we, when we next come back up, we have to give ourselves a realistic chance of actually having a chance of staying up because they, they don't look anywhere near it, did they? Well, they lost Ben, ben Dia, didn't they, to, to Villa? I uh, think of, I don't think I pronounced that right, but you know he he was he was outstanding last year when he got promoted. Um, and like I say, they've made eleven they've made eleven signings, um, and it just it just doesn't look like um, it, it, you know that, that 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 kind of influx of players has worked. Um, so yeah, uh, like I say, they look like they look like a team that's doomed at the moment, Norwich. And um, you know, it, it's it's going to be a hard watch for their supporters, even though they, they're obviously delighted to be in the Premier League. You know, you don't see, want to see your team getting, you know, shipping five, six, seven goals every week. I think the board had in, and introduced this new concept of being a top twenty-five, top twenty-six yeah. club, which is quite an interesting um, excursion from from the sort of binary of of Premier League Championship. Chris, another game that stands out, Leicester v Arsenal. That, that should be a cracker. That Arsenal made a great recovery from a woeful start and Leicester started poorly too. That they're, Both teams are flying at the minute. Is that a good test of Arsenal's sort of how far, of, how much progress they've made under Arsenal? Yeah, I, I think this is the, the kind of, yeah, the, the big test of it. They've, they've, they've performed well in recent weeks. Um, they obviously did a big win in the North London Derby, which was, was really impressive. And But this is a, a, a an informed Leicester side who who will come come and attack them, and then I think that's what Arsenal's maybe kind of weak point is when teams put them under a bit of pressure. Can they can they deal with? It? And I think Leicester will do that. So we'll we'll know a bit more about maybe what Arsenal can can achieve this season. But it has been an incredible kind of kind of I suppose comeback from the start. The level on points with with Manchester United and Everton who were flying high at the start of the season. So Whereas Arsenal were looking like they, that, that top six would be even beyond them, but now they're they're up there, and it's this is I suppose Arteta's got to prove himself in big games against good managers like Rogers. That yes, tactically he's very good, but when he has to make in-game changes, can he do it, and are he adaptable enough? And I think a game against Leicester will, will kind of test that. Do you think Rogers will be on um, United's radar? I think he should be. Um, for the kind of points I made out earlier, he's, he's done a really good job at Leicester, done a good job at Celtic. He did a good job initially at Liverpool. It went really went wrong towards the end, but um, he's, he's got the credentials. I think the two issues, as I said earlier, were the fact that three times they've kind of been in the mix with something in the Premier League, twice with Leicester in the Champions League and fallen off Liverpool for the title that year, um, which was a, a team led by Suarez. Let's not forget it was a, if a quite an average team, but Luis Suarez took them to another level. But they did never got over the line, and that would be the kind of thing maybe the doubts over can he get a, a, a top team over the line? Um, the other point is can can they appoint a former Liverpool manager? I know he's not held as a Liverpool legend because he didn't win that title, and it, and he and it kind of went bad for him there. So it's not like a Rafa Benitez coming into Manchester United or anything like that, but. I still think it'd be a tough sell and he'd be on basically it'd be under pressure straight away i think to get results it kind of like benitez at everton where it's not a great starting ground because there'd be certain elements or certain sections of the fans basically wanting you to fail and as soon as you start showing any weaknesses they'd be jumping on you and i think rogers would have that similar problem at united so i think those would be two issues they would have to look at but if Pochettino wasn't available, if you're looking for a manager to develop, play attack and football, not afraid to play young players and give them a chance, then he has that on his CV. Yeah. Kids, the games, we've, we've talked about the games and the big games, but none feels bigger than Spurs Man United this weekend. For obvious no, with, with respect to 18 other clubs, is that, all eyes will be on um, on that one, won't it? I mean, it was, 
dubbed earlier in the week as sort of El Sakiko, but I think that's probably not going to be the case for a variety of reasons, not least of which because um, of, of the sort of lack of options at United for a, for a replacement and, and because Nuno at Spurs, whilst somebody described him last night at Burnley as, as Mourinho without the charisma, um, he's, he's never never short of throwing a bit, bucket of cold water on expectation when instead you know instead of wrapping things up but uh, he's he's sort of uh, flexing his muscles at Spurs as he tries to knock his side into shape but I don't think there's any any suggestion that that the the uh, axe is falling at, at, at Spurs but yeah I mean it's it's a, it's going to be a terrific game in prospect isn't it um there's so many so many subplots on the side that almost the action on the pitch is, is almost irrelevant. Do you expect um, some big selection decisions from Solskjaer? I mean, you know, will he bring back Pogba? He can't, he can't play Pogba. Would he, think, would he ever consider dropping Ronaldo? Well, that's the, that's the big one, isn't it? It's, it's um, Cavani in for Ronaldo would be the big shout. Um, I can't see him doing it. I can't see him doing it because I think the, the risk... The risk of dropping Ronaldo and and losing is just would be potentially catastrophic for. But he's got nothing to doesn't. lose, surely. Uh, I think well, that's where big managers got to make big decisions. Any, he? he's going to prove know. himself. I think he has to show a bit of kind of bravery because something has to change from that result last week, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean the uh, thing is, it look it looks like a situation where you, you know the, the cliche is always you know no player is bigger than a club. Well, at the moment, Cristiano looks Ronaldo looks bigger than Manchester United, yeah. and for for a, for a club of that stature, that's that's kind of that's unacceptable. Now, does he deserve his place at team? Well, he's the only you know he's scoring goals. He's not scored in the league, I don't think, for a few, a few games. Um, but you know he's he's scoring goals. But does he deserve his? You know players have got to do more than just score goals. It sounds crazy. It's the hardest thing you know in the game to do. But you know does he? If if Solskjaer is going to try and press Tottenham, then you know he's got to find a way to get Ronaldo to put in the hard yards. Well, and I can't see it. I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I was sent a stat this week um, from the office um, that Ronaldo has only one United player's run less than Ronaldo in games this season. I know you don't sign Ronaldo to yeah, yeah. track track back <laughs> <laughs> track back. He's got to score goals and influence games at that end of the pitch. But when you look at teams like Liverpool and City, their first line of defence is awesome, isn't it? The front three, it's just yeah. just they never stop. They never stop working. Well, do you know what? I mean, going back to Brendan Rodgers earlier, um, it, it was quite a pointed dig that Rodgers took at United when they beat them four two at the uh, the King Power the other week, and he kind of mocked. The way that United had tried to press Leicester in the second half, and just said that you know that that played right into their hands. Yeah. And um, you know, if if opposition managers, uh, you know, are going into games thinking, well, if United try and play us that way, then we've got a great chance of winning. To be fair, you know, Solskjaer's reputation at United was built on playing counter-attacking football. Um, he, he clearly feels that to, you know to to take that next step, he, that you, they have to get on the front foot, but. They just haven't got the personnel to do it, not just Ronaldo, but other players as well. I think one thing they'll have been working on on the training ground this week, which was screamingly obvious, was if you're going to press, you're going to press all together. Yeah. Um, press the unit. unit. It's, it's, it's sort of kamikaze stuff, pressing it in individually. Yeah. Just before we move on to the final section, can I just ask each and every one of you for your predictions for that game, please? Uh, I'll go with Tottenham to Manchester United two. Oh, what sort of prediction is that? A draw? Yeah. <laughs> Good. What a prediction? Eh? I can't. If I predicted to draw. I predicted. That's to not draw. how this game works, Chris. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Solskjaer would take a draw quite happily now. Yeah. You know what? I think United will win. He's, he, he, I he's just think they're, 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 that was yeah. he needs to. I, I, and I think there has got to be a reaction from the players. I, I yeah. just think that you know th th there has got to be some kind of response to that defeat against Liverpool. And and I just I just think United will will will, will win there. And also say if there isn't a reaction, that is the most damning oh, fact of all on Solskjaer's yeah. management, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. Um, um, Sadly, this week, um, we've seen a managerial great of, of the game uh, die in Walter Smith, the Scottish legend. Uh, 21 trophies in two spells at Rangers. 
Uh, also had four years at Everton and um, was manager of the Scotland team on a couple of occasions too. When you read all the kind words that everyone's um, um, said to him, obviously Fergie was um, very emotional in what he said about um, Walter Smith. It, 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 it's a sad, sad occasion really because he was a giant of the game, wasn't he? Si, did you have any dealings with him? Uh, yeah, yeah. When he was when he was Everton manager, um, spoke to Walter a few times, and he was always, as everybody didn't know him very well, but he was always a kind of you know real a real gent. Um, clearly, a, as you say, a, a giant of Scottish football. Um, you know, legend at, at, at Ibrox, and the, the 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 kind of accolade for me that I, I thought um, touched on the greatness of, of Walter Smith, not just as a manager but as a man, was was Ali McCoist. Who got quite emotional on on talk sport, saying you know that, that he basically became his second father, and uh, you know Ali, you know Ali w- w- was was very upset about about what was passing you know passing away this week. Um, but uh, you know, like I say, it, it says everything that uh, you know that everybody who came across Walter has has only got good words to say about him. Um, you know, yeah, so, I read this, I read an article with Stuart McCall actually who played for him at Rangers and he said that he always referred to him as Sir Walter because he just presumed he'd been knighted but he never was knighted <laughs> he couldn't he was absolutely gobsmacked when somebody pointed out he actually didn't get knighted but the fact that Celtic play. you know the fact that Celtic play Celtic fans and and, and ex Celtic players have also come out and paid tribute to him yeah. says says a lot about the man because. We all know how kind of you know it is a great divide in Glasgow along the lines of, of football, and and I thought that that showed the kind of you know the scope of uh, of Walter Smith. Yeah, sad occasion that sad to hear that of his passing. Right, guys, we're wrapping it up. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Gideon. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sai. Um, thanks everyone for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>